Grand Rising Soul family, Adam Jackson here with another episode of the Sacred Sons podcast. But this is not just any episode. This is going to be the ultimate embodiment episode. That's what I'm calling it, Mark. Listen, I'm, I'm British. We understate things. We should go for a sort of decent, fairly nice embodiment episode. <laughs> a decent, fairly nice embodiment episode. Our guest today is Mark Walsh. I'm looking forward to dropping in with him on just that. Embodiment practices, embodiment facilitation, and ultimately integration of this work into our lives. And with that, Sacred Sons, I want you to know that we have the EMX coming to cities all around the globe. The EMX is the Embodied Masculine Experience. And Mark, we came up with this in 2019. And I saw you wrote your book also the book embodiment Uh moving beyond mindfulness you also got the hit in 2019 you know what i'm saying like we we got we got a similar message (laughs) i've been a full-time embodiment teacher for about 20 years and uh, finally got around to writing the book it was um someone just put it together for me they're like hey you keep writing great things on social media and they actually sent me it and said look i put a bunch of them into a book and then we had sort of bash it into shape but um yeah, you can't learn embodiment from a book, but uh, it's nice to have one out. Yeah. Beautiful. And like I said, Sacred Sons, you can't find embodiment in a book, but you can find it in real embodied experience alongside your brothers, reconnecting to the land, connecting to nature, connecting to yourself, and ultimately connecting to your heart. That's the work that Sacred Sons is doing. If you are interested, please go to sacredsons.com, click on the EMX. I will be leading the upcoming EMX San Diego and also July 5th through 9th, I will be leading EMX Vancouver, British Columbia. Again, if you're interested, go to sacredsons.com. And with that, our guest today, he is the author of Embodiment, Moving Beyond Mindfulness. He's the host of the Embodiment podcast and he is a facilitator and trainer. Please welcome Mark Walsh. Pleasure to be here. I hear a lot of good things, actually. Thank you, Mark. Listen, we've reached peak embodiment. I just saw you posted recently. Prince Harry is talking about embodiment. It's it's reached mainstream. What are your thoughts on this after being a practitioner in this for for twenty plus years? What what, do you, what is your sense? <laughs> it's partly my fault, obviously. Um, we haven't reached peak embodiment as a culture, but quite the opposite. We've reached peak, peak disembodiment, I would say. <laughs> getting true. getting to the point where the disconnection from the body is driving us absolutely insane, you know, in terms of mental ill health, addiction, you know, relationship breakup, all the things that come with not being connected to the body. Um, however, as you rightly point out, uh, there's a way in which it's trending. You know, you've got Prince Harry with Gabal Mata, who does great embodied trauma work. Um, you've got people talking about it on Joe Rogan. The hashtag is popular on Instagram, sometimes appropriately, sometimes not. Right. Um, you know, it's been my life's work to make uh, this concept, this word um, out there. And, and of course, it's as old as human history. You know, it's not as shamanism. And there's definitely people in the 60s and 70s doing great work around it. Body therapists before that in the turn of the century, 100 years ago or so. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly, you know, I've come to be associated with the word in the modern era because the big conferences and books and podcasts and things like that. Yeah. And so you are one who also speaks about spiritual trends and kind of like meeting it with, with, a, with a light take and meeting it with humor, which is also a, a part of embodiment. Where does that yeah, part of you come from? It's probably Anglo-Irish. I mean, I'm from an Irish family that takes the piss out of everything. And, you know, we, we like to take what we do seriously, but not, you know, not ourselves too seriously. And I think um, some of the stuff can, you know, in spirituality takes itself a little seriously. And that ultimately uh, just encourages a little bit of humor, a little bit of prodding and poking. And um, I think I'm just personality-wise inclined that way. Um, you know, that Irish rebel background I have very much doesn't like to see um, kings and uh, priests. They're uh, both pretty toxic forces. Yeah, yeah, full on. And I like that you acknowledge too, it's like, if you're going to be doing this kind of work, there are no gurus. It's not, a, it's, it's really not about that. And it's, it's like the age of the guru is over. The age of the lone wolf is over. 
Yeah, I think people have started to see the need for a community, for accountability. Um, I think there's a shadow that comes with that as well. I mean, the positive is that there's been so many sort of abuse stories from spiritual gurus of various kinds that people have become skeptical of that, uh, skeptical of people claiming that they have the line to God or that they should you know, submit to an individual's authority because we're all corruptible and we're all only human. And so it tends not to do well, that kind of guru model, particularly in the West, right? There may be our cultures where it works better. Um, and, you know, I grew up with sort of very traditional sort of martial arts senseis, very much sort of more Asian model of respect and lineage. And there's some positives in that. And I think there is a sort of shadow right now. So sort of no one's allowed to be a guru. It's a sort of shadow of American democracy, really. That we're all equal, which is true as human beings. You know, we all have an equal value as human beings. Me, you, a kid in Ethiopia, a business guy in Brazil, whatever. Uh, but we don't have all equal. We don't have equal knowledge. We don't have any equal experience. And um, that's, that's the shadow side. Yeah, leadership is still a requirement, whether you're hierarchical or not. Mm. And embodied leadership at that. And that's that's the piece that I think is important. Important to yeah. Know. I've worked in the corporate sector, I worked in NGO a lot, military, uh, Ukraine last year. Mm. And, you know, the, the leadership doesn't come from having clever words to say. It can be nice if you've got a good speech writer or something. It comes from that moment when you're calm when everybody else is losing the plot or you're passionate and inspiring when everybody else is sort of dead. Um, the ability to empathize, the ability to self-regulate, self-awareness, these are all embodied qualities. You know, when I yes. work with corporate leaders, I, I walk in and say, look, you guys are smart. You know your jobs, but none of you are inspiring. None of you are really connected to yourselves, and people feel that, and they don't like it. Yeah. And so just just touching again on this theme, that, embodi that embodiment is reaching the mainstream. Yeah. In Sacred Sons, we have we got police officers who are, <laughs> who are breathwork practitioners and facilitators. We have sheriffs who are Reiki masters. We, 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 have, we have brothers... We have brothers who are like in these realms of corporate, mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. also and they're also claiming and owning uh, their gifts and the and the pieces that yeah. are that are true to themselves. And so, and I and I know you're doing this work too. So I, I wanted to, I do want to ask you about Ukraine. But what are you seeing out there when you, when you see embodied police officers? You know, what does that what does that yeah, mean? Yeah, well, I find I, I, I work with police in the UK. I work with some of the top police in the UK a while back, and um, I found them very teachable. Actually, I found them great to work with. Yeah, and um, I think when I first did corporate work like twenty years ago, I would talk about meditation or centering or embodiment, any of these things, and people would freak out. People would find it the weirdest thing, and I think the sort of mindfulness revolution has led the way. And you know, revolution is actually the wrong word. The mindfulness trend, movement. the mindfulness. Trend, I call it a movement. Yeah, yeah. And it's not really been as revolutionary as it could have been because it hasn't been really adopted in a deep way or an organizational way. It hasn't been as transformative as that technology was really designed to be if you study Buddhism in depth. Um, however, it opened the door. And, you know, God bless John Kabat-Zinn and all the other people involved in that. Uh, and it opened the door. And now it's like, hey, is this kind of like mindfulness? I'm like, yeah, and a bit more. You know, mindfulness plus, awareness and choice, not just being aware. And that's opened the door. It's become way more possible you know, I have students from all over the place, all over the world, different cultures. I've taught about 50 countries. And I've seen, and in different countries, it's at different points, right? There's different trends, different things are popular. But um, Different culture. So, different culture. I mean, when I've worked in Russia or Israel or New Zealand, mm -hmm. they're totally different. And culture's embodied, so I'm, I'm fascinated by that. And it's certainly got easier for me over the years. You know, it's got less weird for people. Yeah. Yeah. So let me let me dive in. You mentioned Ukraine. What inspired you? What is the aspect of your embodiment that felt called to? I think you've been over there twice now, and you you set up kind of a, a nonprofit or a donation over there. Yeah, yeah I've been there twice last year, but I've been many times before that. I met my yeah. wife there. Um, I mean, I was made for it. Like you know, I was talking to my mum before going. She's like, "Don't go," because you know that's what mums have to say, right? They have to say, "Don't go do this." You know, this do men's work. And I was like, Mum, I was made for this. I like there was this, there was no better place for me. And when I was there, I was totally on purpose, totally lit up. Every picture of me, I'm smiling, even if I'm in a bomb shelter. And um, you're sort of 
to take a step back, the current conflict is an extension of an earlier, smaller conflict. And that was where I met my wife. She was my interpreter. So I already knew loads of psychologists out there. And um, so I had the connections. I had a bit of the language. I speak some Russian. Um, was learning a bit of Ukrainian. And I just saw a need because I realized the psychological services would be totally swamped. And my original thought actually was to go fight. You know, I'm a fighter at heart. And one, one of my friends kind of went, Mark, uh, you'll be a terrible soldier and get killed, but you're a pretty good trauma trainer. Why don't you go do that? Because that's what yeah, you're actually qualified. And, and largely that's what's, that's what's needed. That's what's missing. Yeah. So I went over there and we set up a, a, an NGO. Uh, now I supervise it from afar. I was talking to one of the girls from there last night. Uh, I think they've trained something like 15,000 people so far. And you know, they've made Lviv the world's most trauma aware city and they're now working on the rest of the country. So um, what they're doing is really incredible. I'm really proud to have had some um, part in starting it. We deliver medical supplies. You know, there's a whole team of people involved, so I don't want to take all the credit. And um, it's actually, you know, a group of young women on the ground who are doing that work now. And um, I'm there in the background supervising them, giving them extra training and things like that. Incredible. Uh, And I love your humility in it. And this is such a beautiful example of how this work um, is permeating. You know, there are ripples to this work. And so I, I'm hearing that this work rippled into your life, men's work, that men's work somehow, you know, got your attention. What would you say was your, your first experience in a men's work space? Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I got into embodiment was I didn't have a great relationship with my dad. My dad was alcoholic, and I followed in his footsteps. And by the time I was a teenager, I knew I needed something stronger, firmer, a bit more supportive than what Western culture has to offer men. And I I walked into a martial arts studio, and it was many things. It was the beauty, it was the power, it was the elegance. It was a, you know, I was dealing drugs at the time, so it was a practical need for self-defense as well. Um, But it was also... um, that I saw men treating each other respectfully, that they were role models. And I remember discipline and the respect and the fact that I could learn something from older men and that I was re-fathered. I've had various mentors in the martial arts world, the trauma world. It's a guy called Paul Linden. It's like a second dad to me. Um, And they re-fathered me really in a way and gave me what I didn't really have either from the culture or from, from my own dad that, you know, God love him was doing his best. But, um, yeah, I needed something. And uh, the kind of masculine discipline of martial arts was was my entry point into embodiment. And there was definitely an element of that that was male. I mean, I've, you know, I've been involved in some men's work and other things since then, but um, yeah, there was definitely that element. Yeah. And so you're, you're doing the work. What was your pathway into, you know, coming full full cycle? What I mean by that is you've gone through your own initiation. You've gone through rites of passage, and now you're a, a leader and facilitator in it and, and bringing it to the real world. This is like what I'm, what I'm, what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, I, a lot of it lives inside those circles. You understand what I mean? Yeah. A, lot, a lot of that energy yeah. lives, but the, now it's, it's rippling out to the point where you're having impact amidst what could become you know, the next global war. Yeah, it's really already. Um, yeah. I guess I started off at Aikido Dojo just kind of getting my own self together, getting my shit together. You know, I need to get go. sober. I need to learn some discipline. I need, to, I need to not be weak, basically. I need to find a way to be strong that actually match my values. Like Aikido and other martial arts did that. And at first, I was living in dojos and working on myself, and that was great. And then there came a point where I went, okay, but what's the point in all this if we're not using it in the world? And that's when I started yeah. getting involved in a nonprofit. Uh, projects. There was one in Cyprus with the UN that really started it off. I did stuff in the Middle East, Sierra Leone, Afghanistan. Lived with a circus in Ethiopia. Lived above a nightclub in Brazil, working in the slums there. So did some interesting stuff. Um, what kind of work would you do in the slums of Brazil, for example? In the favelas, what was going down there? Yeah, a lot, a lot. Um, we were teaching kids Aikido, but the, from the mm. point of view of actually being role models, from the point of view of actually giving the kids some discipline and giving the kids some some hope and some confidence and, you know, sort of uh, piggybacking social skills and various other things within that. Yes. Um, the physical and the relational. These these are the two pillars of yeah. embodiment that are, that are so key. And I love that bringing the consciousness into the, into the martial arts, into Aikido. Not that it's inherently not there, but there's a new, there's a new standard <clears throat> of masculine embodiment. I feel that 
can be brought with the martial arts. Could you speak a little bit on that in your experience? Yeah, I mean, there's traditional approaches which will do it and they'll do it in the sort of the long run. You know, like Japanese kid, kids would use martial arts for years as part of school. Yeah, it's normal. Yeah. Uh, but you can speed that process up by bringing in some, you know, Western psychology and trauma awareness and, you know, re- bringing the emotional intelligence skills and the various other embodiment intelligence skills into the practice. And, and you know, any practice is good. Like, you, for, in terms of getting in your body, it's great whatever you're doing. Um, my students will be dancing this weekend. I've got a bunch of mentees in town. You know, we eat together, we dance together, we meditate together. We'll do some training that's a bit like martial arts, but it's more accessible for those that would find traditional martial arts physically very difficult. Um, we even do some more things that are more like improvisational comedy, uh, some yoga. Like all of these disciplines fall under the umbrella of what we could call embodiment, and they they each have their beauty. And I'm I'm a generalist, you know. I started off in martial arts, but I've, I've done everything now, and I've done a little bit of everything and a lot of a few things because you can't do a lot of everything. And um, yeah, it's very beautiful. They each have something to offer, and we're actually a unique time in human history where they're all on offer. Uh, particularly if you live in a big city, if you're in Berlin or London or wherever, this, this, even a little town like where I live in the countryside, there's a lot here, man. We've got conscious dance four times a week. It's a tiny town. So it's happening. Um, it's really happening, it's isn't it? It's good stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a, people have realised that life as it, the disconnected life of technology, isolation, lack of community, lack of ritual, all those things that, you know, men's work has to also involve, as you know, um, yeah. that leads to just people going crazy and being unhappy. So um, I think people are reaching out for ways to connect both internally to their bodies, but also, you know, that enables connection and relationship and community and the environmental aspect. Beautiful. The mark of a great, not only men's work facilitator, but a facilitator, martial arts and improv comedy. <laughs> range. No, like, range. That's, a, that's, a, that's like a beautiful range for a facilitator. Tell me a little bit about the improv life. What, like, yeah, well, have you, you know, were you funny as a kid? Where did that come from? Uh, I mean, I'm from a, a culture that values verbal humor. That's certainly there. You know, Anglo Irish culture is definitely something I notice. Um, so martial arts taught me like discipline and self regulation, and you know, it's great. You know, start get some body awareness. That plus meditation. Getting that warrior. Yeah, the warrior archetype, right? If you're looking at it from an archetype point of view. Um, but then it's like, okay, but that's not everything in life. What about self-expression? Like, like for me, a leader, they can turn you on. They can make you laugh. They can inspire you. They can terrify you. They, all of these yes. things. Like, you need to yes. regulate and down-regulate. You need to be able to express as well as contain. And, like, sometimes I see when people get, you know, I, I did Aikido and it was great, but then my learning curve slowed off. And I went to Tango. And there's uh, women in fabulous shoes with perfume. And it's like, oh, this is a whole nother challenge now. You know, I can deal with guys hitting me with sticks, but this is a different, <laughs> now I'm nervous now. You know, like I'm not nervous in a war zone, but you know, a beautiful woman with nice perfume and high heels, woo! Now I'm perturbed, now I've got another practice. So, um, yeah, I think we need to balance our personalities with our practice and mm. not get too caught in one thing. And find your range. I think this is beautiful advice for all of us as humans. Let's find our range and not get too pigeonholed in any one ideology, any one way, any one uh, adaptation of a characteristic for who we are, but to find our range and to express and experience our range as human beings. This is, this is living a full life. Yeah, I mean, most of my students, the first thing, you know, whether they're on a coaching course or a leadership course or whatever, is they need to figure out kind of where they're already strong because a lot of personal growth just plays to weakness and that's the problem, right? Where are we strong? And it's good to be great at something. It's good to be really good at something. Um, but then also look at where you might need a bit of work and kind of fill in the gaps or, or else people just choose body practices that deepen their neurosis. You know, all the control freaks go off and do Iyengar yoga and it's like, no, that's totally, you know, the yang people all do the yang yoga instead of the yin yoga, you know, it's whatever model you're using, archetypes, yin yang for elements, it's, you need some a basic model and then you can go, all right, where's already strong? Where needs a bit of work? And then there's other pieces like the trauma healing, the community, you know, other aspects too. Yeah. I love how you just, you just rattled it off there. You know, whether you use the archetypes, the four elements, this, that, the other, it's like, it, it's all written. And that's, that's a, it's a important piece because at the end of the day, you're not going to find it in a book. And the only understanding of embodiment that is of any usefulness to you is your own experiential understanding, your own knowledge, your own experienced 
learning. Yeah, you can't eat a menu. And in another way of looking at this is kind of like, you know, my own childhood. Like, like I read all the books. I was bright as a kid. I'd read the yeah. whole library at what you would call high school. And I was like, okay, I've read the library, but I'm still suicidal and drug addicted and miserable. And it's like, what's going on? Like, I'm clever. You know, I had a high IQ by the sort of Western standards. Yeah. And then I went, oh, it's not in the library. You know, I can teach someone the theory of embodiment very briefly. That doesn't take long. But the practice, now that's where the sweat is. And we kind of don't really understand what learning is because we, we use one verb to learn to mean different things. And there's learning about something. And then there's, you know, different ways of knowing, like John Verbeke would say. There's learning to do something, which is a skill. And then there's learning to be something, which is another level, right? Yeah. So um, it kind of comes from our education system. We think we can learn about something and, you know, that's all good, but you've got to practice. Practice an immersion. That's the other thing you need. Immersion. Yeah. There's a cultural piece there. I wanted to, let's go a layer deeper if you're, if you're willing. Mm-hmm. Let's go for it. Because I heard in there, um, yes, it, we have to celebrate our strengths, our, our mastery, and oftentimes that can inform us for, for other pieces that we want to bring in. And as leaders, it's important that we are acknowledging and aware of our shadow. Mm-hmm. And so it's not just like, uh, it's not weakness, but it is, it is acknowledging the shadow even within that mastery. And so like, is yeah. there a piece there that you could say like in your own, in your own arc, <laughs> like what's, a, what's, a, what's an, a, a, an acknowledgement or a piece for you that has been like, like, damn, like this is, you know, this is that, this is that yin and yang of my own leadership. Yeah, sometimes I teach it in a sort of skills-based model, and then you can just look at where your skills lacking. Like, you know, given the childhood I had and my personality, my just self-regulation just wasn't very good. You yeah. know, hence the ginger pans and things like that. And it, it's now, I'd say average, Adam, average. Um, but average is enough to get me through life without causing too much trouble, you know, too much chaos. <laughs> um, so this, this is a sort of skills model. If we look at a qualities model... I've traditionally been much stronger on fire and air than earth and water. Yeah. So just knowing that's great. Like I can, you know, I, I hire German women to organize my courses and they're terrifyingly organized and earthy. It's great. I love them. Alina, if you're out there, I love you. And <laughs> so we can sort of hire our way out of that to some extent, but you still got to do some work, you know, yeah. you can't just hire your way out of it or team your way out of it. Um, and then, you know, if you really, really want to go into shadow, now we're talking about, you know, the union kind of concepts of really act, not just unbuilt skills, but things that are actively repressed and denied. Right. Right. And I, I think anyone who's a leader in this field is going to be confronted with sex and with power and with money. And I don't know, no, don't know anyone who isn't screwed up with at least one of those three. Wow. Mic drop. <laughs> Let's be honest, man. Like we're human beings, and that stuff fucks you up. But if you're not fucked up already, wait till you've got two hundred Ukrainian women saying you're amazing, or you get a right. shitload of money for the first time in your life, and no one in your family's ever had any. You know, I'm from an Irish peasant background. You know, I, first time I had a bit of money in the bank, I screenshotted it and sent it to my aunt and said, "Look, do you think our granddaddy couldn't even read or write?" would have believed this, wow. you know? Wow. So it's, um, of course you're going to struggle with money. Of course you're going to struggle with the, the power and the influence. And you've got kids, you know, becoming massive TikTok influencers. You haven't gone through initiations and years of training. You know, I feel sorry <laughs> for those guys. They're just, like, I've struggled with it in a 20 year career, let alone just being thrown into it. I mean, you were a musician before this, right? You knew what it's like to be on a stage and have adoring fans. And that's a hell of a temptation. It's a hell of a corruption if you're not careful. Absolutely. And, and as a young man, there's a, there's a sense that it's not that we don't, we don't, we can't go through it without misalignments, but we have to go through it. Mm. You know, you understand what I'm saying? We have to go through a particular threshold there. And that's a part of our self-knowledge as well. Some of that's father wounding. Yeah. Some of that, you know, some of that comes from, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, just the, the, the pieces that we're called here to carry. Yeah, and I, I'm glad I made some of the mistakes, you know, the alcoholism or, you know, I, I lived above a nightclub in the slums of Brazil. You know, I made some very fun mistakes while I was there. And like, I recommend people have that period. Yeah. 
and guys who kind of get into personal growth too young and they're too pure and they haven't you know made the mistakes it's not always great in the long run right there's a, a common mistake of pedestaling leaders in that in that case and this is why accountability is so important a man left accountable to no one what him, but himself cannot be trusted yeah, you, so you can we can we create real accountability between men in this world because we not because it's valuable but because we're called to it. Yeah, I think from the ethical point of view, you really need three things. You need to be in your body so you can listen to your conscience, which is not mental, it's physical. Right? The the, the quiet voice in your heart that says this isn't cool, man. Or that right. says, you know, exactly. hey, you have to pray and do something. You know, the opposite. It can be positive as well as negative. And then we have to have people around us to hold us to account. You know, I, I co-train on nearly all my courses. I think you guys do too, because there's two of us, yeah. you know? And it's, it's, and then you have to have rules. And people don't like rules, um, but you need them. Like in my organization, it's like, I don't fuck my students. That's a hard rule. 100%. I just don't do it. Okay, I'm not an angel. I'm not a saint. I'm not saying I've never been attracted to any of them. I just don't fuck my students. And that is a rule in our company. And if you want to work with me, that is the rule we have. It's, it, it's beyond a rule. It becomes an agreement that because you communicate it and then it becomes a standard mm. that you carry. And also I say that publicly. So if I ever tried, people would be like, what the fuck? You know, I'm accountable to everyone because I've said it out loud so many times. Right. And so do you, do you believe that there is a new standard for men? It's a loaded question. Um, I believe there's an old standard we need to get back to, for starters, as a conservative point of view on it. Um, I feel like men are an all-time low in terms of their strength, and I, I mean that physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Mm. Um, I think it can come back very quick. That's what I saw in Ukraine. I think when the, sure. when, when the, when the culture supports it, you hear Ukrainian women say things like, we love our men. They are brave, and they protect us, and they are noble. No yeah. sarcasm, no cynicism, no hipster bullshit. They yeah. love the men. And there's a hugeness to say that they're not all, you know, there's, of course there's bad Ukrainians, whatever, there's corrupt ones, whatever. But there's a nobility that came back very strongly. And a lot of bullshit goes out the window when there's a war. Mm. And <clears throat> if, you know, if, if we're not in a war or something that's a dojo that feels like a war, we kind of need to bring the war to ourselves, right? We need to go through hardships. We need to go through challenges. We need to have those intense experiences of bonding and contribution. Because without that, we we are a decadent culture. There's no doubt about it. You know, this is the, I was just reading about the Carthaginians today. Uh, I've you know, read about other cultures in decline. This is, we are a decadent culture. Yeah. Hmm. I'm wondering if you can... <sighs> Let's, I want to shift it back. I want to shift it back to the trends. Yeah. Just because I think it's important to note, you know, there are, there are trends in all of this. And in the, in, the spiritual, in the spiritual movement, I judge it to be like this. It starts with an awakening. Meditation, self-realization, yoga, self-love, physical movement, physical practices. I, I also believe... BJJ Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is branching yeah, off of this. Yeah, great practice. Love it. Love it. Love and it. then, and then it's plant medicines, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then it's embodiment, and then it's integration. <laughs> and here we are. And 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 I, I just wanted to summarize like the the a typical mm -hmm. spiritual journey. Is that does that sound about right to you? Did I miss anything? No, it's great. I mean, I've been around long enough to see the trends come and go. I yeah. mean, I think some of them are really answers that are either necessary answers to some of the problems of our time. So we live in a disconnected world, hence we need embodiment and mindfulness. We just do. You know, just, it used to be a luxury, now it's just to get through the day, you know? Um, yes, yeah. yes, it's, yes. This is no Big longer time. a first world luxury. It used Big to be time. only weird people, damaged people and hippies did yoga. Now everyone who lives in London has to do something like yoga or meditation just to, so they don't go insane. Yeah. Um, they, they, so there's an app, and there's an app for that. Even the technology's on board. Let's get a breathwork app. You know, let's I get mean, a meditation app. That's my that's mother happening. used to, have to drive 50 miles to go to a nearest yoga class. Now there's one on every block, so we have an accessibility thing. So there is not just a trend. There's also a directionality. It's lovely to see ethnogens, plant medicines come back. You know, that's been a part of my life since I was 14 years old. So, you know, I was in Amsterdam <laughs> doing that not so long ago. And um, it's great to see that come back in a really conscious way. 
Uh, it's great to see the research base on that and mindfulness. It's great to see embodiment trending. Um, so I think there are trends, there are fashions, and we have to be a little bit careful uh, that they're not just hijacked by, I mean, what's left in a culture that has forgotten its soul is just narcissism and nihilism. Yeah. You, you're either hedonistic because it's like, hey, nothing matters. And I've tried this. Like, nothing matters, so let's just snort, drink, inject, whatever, fuck, whatever. Or he says, nothing matters. Nihilism is always hedonism. Or it's narcissism. It's like, nothing matters except me. And so this is where you get the sort of selfie yoga culture. Or people do plant medicine and then think they're, you know, have this amazing state and all of a sudden feel like they're God. I'm like, no, 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 no. no. You touch God. You're not God. Um, well, then, and then, and then they go, okay, well, I'll just start pouring the medicine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be they the, go from I'll God be, to shaman real quick. I'll be the leader. Shamans are uh, real quick to develop, right? You know, I was 10 years before I was allowed to teach Aikido, 10 years of study, including three residential years, three live-in years. That's powerful. D just like bringing that martial arts back into the embodiment. S slow down. This is a great time for us as men to call, to put out the call like, hey, we're choosing to slow down technologically, I mean, think about the situation we're, we're in with AI, um, but also um, in, in, in what the technology is doing to, to us and our children, and we, we can collectively acknowledge that. Like, damn, who's, who is the one on, who's got their hand on the dial? Yeah, there is an algorithm that is designed to maximize our engagement through fear, anxiety, and aggravation. And that has had a huge effect on our politics, polarizing it. It's had a huge effect on our psychology. Yeah. And it's not a conspiracy. It's just people trying to maximize their ad revenue. You know, it's psychopathic, but it's not a conspiracy. And we've just let that into all our homes yeah. like it was nothing. I, I think this is where we, we need not, to- Not only did we let it in, we, we invited it in. We asked, we, we, we begged for it when we couldn't afford it. We said, yeah, we said, I'll pay money to be spied upon. I'll pay money to have my nervous system wrecked. I'll pay, I'll pay whatever you want to yes. mainline that. I mean, I love going on retreat and turning my phone off or going into the woods and leaving yes. my phone behind. You know, it's well the worth best. it. The best. We can, I'm not anti-tech. I mean, you know, the fact that we're doing podcasts, Adam, is great, right? That we can reach out, you know, our podcast got 1.2 million downloads. I'm just a kid from a farm and I'm doing a podcast to reach over a million people. I'm running a company and then get to do all these things and travel and all that. Technology is great, but it, but it's also sending us nuts. And um, I think we have to take quite a firm stand against it. And, and at least at times how we moderate it. Technology is not the only influence. There's other cultural forces that are out there, but um, yeah. yeah, it's definitely one. All right. Let me ask you, let me ask you this question because this is also a cultural time of the gig culture, the, like the gig economy. And uh -huh. I imagine there's a lot of people who listen to this podcast who are in some way in an entrepreneurial situation. Sure. Whether that, whether they call that side hustle, like I said, like a, you know, a passion project or whatever that is. So what is, what is like a piece that you could share here on and I'm calling you an entrepreneur. I don't know if that's something you identify as. That's but, fine. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what, like what's a piece of uh, wisdom here that you could share from your experience? Well, we're talking about job insecurity fundamentally. Um, what I say, <laughs> right? Like, like, if you want to be terrified every day, work for yourself. You know, <laughs> like, like I was in three hundred thousand pounds of debt last year for a few months. You know, it's terrifying. Shit like that can happen. Not anymore, thank God. Um, <laughs> Really terrifying. Uh, I mean, I talked to my mom about it. I'm like, how do, you, how do you talk to my sister about it? It's like, how do you even relate to that? You know, she couldn't even relate. Um, so you have to get used to dealing with fear, which is a good thing. And actually, you know, the heart of the masculine work, I would say. You have to get used to dealing with insecurity and fear, which, you know, Buddhists tell us is the nature of life. You know, mm. There will be suffering. There will be taxation. And um, I think the other thing from an embodiment point of view is creativity, constant creativity, because the world's changing so fast. I have all my best ideas after dancing, meditating, or walking in the woods. Mm. And actually, I can guarantee anyone listening to this, where do you have your best ideas? I guarantee it's walking in nature after being mindful or maybe in the shower or on the toilet. Why? Because you're relaxed and you're in your body. That's where everyone has their best <laughs> ideas, those four places. So, yeah, oh, I, I, you know, my job as sort of CEO of our little company is basically to have one good idea a week and try not to piss off my employees the rest of the week. That, that's pretty much my job. And the soft skills side of things would be the other side, right? Like 
Yeah. Like your team is as good as your relationships and your relationships are as good as your embodiment. <laughs> it all comes back to the relationships. I love that. Say that one more time. Your team. Your work is based on the quality of your relationships, right? The productivity, the output is based on the relationships, right? If you have, if everyone hates each other, there's no discretionary effort, no trust. That's a problem, big problem. Yeah. But your relationships are based on your own embodiment. Like if I'm not well regulated, I can't regulate, co-regulate my employees freaking out, right? If I'm not well regulated, I'm going to say something mean that I regret to my finance person and have to get a new finance person. I'm just <laughs> using more embodiment skill here, self-regulation, because it's kind of an obvious one. Um, you know, that is, you know, if I'm not well regulated, I'm not well. If I'm not well, I'm grumpy. And then again, I'm, you know, short with my team and then I don't stay in the job. All of a sudden I've lost my PA and I have to find another one. That's a problem, right? Like being the boss doesn't resolve you of, of this responsibility. In fact, it gives you more responsibility. Like I get away less with being an asshole than my employees can, right? So, um, yeah, there's basic skills and I think embodiment, embodiment helps a bit. It doesn't solve all the problems. It's not a panacea. It's not going to, you know, mean that I'm a saint, but it certainly helps. I'm just getting, I'm getting a sense of you, of your, of how you roll. It's cool. It's cool. I, and I, I really, I want to acknowledge you and I want to acknowledge the, the, the young Mark, the one who came from nothing, the one who built it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Well, I always acknowledge my, my dad, who was a teacher, despite his problems, and my mum, who was a teacher, and my granddad, who had the courage to be an immigrant and get on a boat and fight in World War II for five years in order to earn his place so his kids could have an education and not be a peasant, illiterate pe peasant in Ireland. And, um, you know, so I, I stand on their shoulders very much. My grandmother, who was a driving instructor and, you know, was a teacher before me. So I'm third generation in what I do, really. And, wow. um you know, we need to acknowledge our lineages and sometimes those lineages are pain, right? Like I'm lucky in some senses, like my, my family's full of, full of, uh, teachers and military, but it's also full of insane people. Like my family's full of addicts, uh, autistic spectrum, schizophrenics, several suicides. So of course I got interested in psychology <laughs> like that. That was the conspiracy of my life. Yeah. Right. Like, of course I could be helpful in Ukraine because I'm like, guys, this is my sixth war zone. You know, when the first bombshell fell when I was in Lviv, the first alarm went off and everybody else panicked. I went, I've been here before. I grew up in a war zone, you know, emotionally, if not literally. So, um, you know, uh, one way to look at your life I quite like is a conspiracy to get you somewhere helpful for others. And sometimes that, that set of conditions is um, unpleasant. And sometimes we're lucky to have them. And in both cases, we're lucky to have them. Beautiful. All right. I'm feeling like, I'm feeling like I want to invite you to put a call out there. You know, firstly, if brothers are interested, uh, brothers and sisters are interested in working with you, where can they find you? Well, first of all, just credit to you guys. You know, you've done some great work with men's work and you're doing really well. And just want to give you guys some credit, first of all. Uh, nice to see. I keep hearing good things. I'm sure I'll come to something eventually, get there in person. EMX. Um, EMX. Devin, we're coming to Ember Chrome. You have a you have a personal invite from myself. So. I might need next year's dates, but I'd, I'd be curious for sure. <laughs> curious. It's like um, that sometimes. Yeah, just schedules. I mean, in terms of my stuff, I'm easy to find. Mark Walsh Embodiment, embodimentunlimited.com is the company. Loads of free stuff there. Free podcast. There's a free book on there. It's a version of the book. You know, one of my three books you'll find on Amazon. Um, I mean, based Instagram, you'll find me, Mark Walsh, W-A-L-S-H. If you put embodiment into the, you know, you could put embodiment into Grinder, I'd probably come up. So um, I'm there. <laughs> I'm That's hilarious. Someone's going to try that right now. So, I haven't actually tried it, but, you know, I'd like <laughs> if someone's got a Grinder profile and they want to make a Mr. Embodiment one, I'll take it as a compliment. Yeah, Mark, one of the pieces of embodiment I really uh, honor and see in you is commitment. And, it, you know, I can see it in the, the years that you've been committed to this work and to you seeing this through all the way into your your reality and into the work that you're doing there in Ukraine and and even the laughter that you're bringing, you know, and all of it, full spectrum, brother. So I really, I really yeah, see that, that full spectrum. It's what I do, it's what I do. You know, it's good to have a life of meaning. With that, is there any call 
seeing what you see in the world, seeing what you've seen, knowing where this potentially may be going, how would you like, what is your call that you want to put out to men? What is the message yeah. you want to leave with the brothers and sisters who are listening? Get an embodied practice, anyone you enjoy. So don't feel like you should do BJJ because Joe Rogan does or whatever, right? Like just whatever you enjoy, get some kind of, it could be BJJ, it could be Aikido, it could be you know, yoga, it could be kickboxing, whatever. So get some kind of an embodied practice. Have the courage to stand up to a lot of the woke bullshit that is out there, which is anti-male. Do not tolerate anti-male yeah. behavior, speech discrimination. Do not tolerate it. I would add, or anti-female. We got to protect the sacred womb space, you know what I'm saying? Because women are also under attack. I agree, but that is... Um, more of a given though in, in some cases and i did a post about this recently a lot of women really appreciated it i stood up and said hey female is sacred and this is what that means to me and that that's not to be messed around with yeah you know? so i yeah. agree on that i agree on that so that's what i'd say to people listening get an embodied practice stand up to all the kinds of bullshit and uh choose purpose and meaning over hedonism nihilism and narcissism Beautiful. It comes through in an embodied way, Mark. I appreciate you. Appreciate your time. And I would, I would say also get connected because as embodied as, as we can be on our own, when we are in an inter-sovereign connected way in community and community is, man, it's, there's never been an easier time to get connected. Mark has got his, his community, both through leadership trainings uh, and gatherings that he's, he's got going on. Sacred Sons as community building all around the world. Find your tribe. This is the time. Yeah, this 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 is getting together. I'm, I see the video and the pictures from your guys' events. It looks amazing. Um, it, like I'm together with a whole group of mentees from around the world in person today. Yeah, and I do workshops in different places, and we do workshops in you know, beautiful locations by lakes and forests, and sometimes just in the middle of cities. You know, to be accessible. There's no substitute for embodied connection for actually getting together in person. There's no substitute for that. Facts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> From San Diego to Bristol, UK, <clears throat> Mark Walsh, Adam Jackson, Sacred Sons, Mr. Embodiment. We're out, family. Peace. Total pleasure.